All right, so here is the square root of x from 0 to 9. Um, let's see here. One of, one of the uh, models that you all had had cross-sections that were squares. So let me turn this sideways so you can see what's happening um, visually. Okay, n equals the number of cross-sections that we're going to put on here. So if I increase that... Um, <coughs> It's putting them in here. We're getting more and more and more. So as I increase the number of squares that are drawn in this region, we are creating a three-dimensional solid that I will rotate here in a second so you can see it. But this is what is being created. So I can rotate it around. You see the squares, how they're smaller down here. They get bigger, obviously, as the curve gets bigger. There's your side view. Obviously, they're going to get taller. Um, so you can see, and when you look straight on it, it's just going to look like the curve, right? The top view is just going to look like the curve. So you can see from the side what this looks like. Now, if I change my shape, uh, let me change it to somebody else did semicircles. That solid becomes a lot smaller um, because the semicircles are not going to have the same. Um, the, the height, the radius, is only half the distance to the curve. Um, so we end up with a smaller solid. Um, but you can see what that looks like there. Um, now, none of you, I don't, nobody here had triangles, but let's look at some examples of some triangles, what they look like. If we have equilateral triangles, so all the sides are the same, um, obviously we're going to see the triangle there. Uh, it's going to have kind of a ridge on this solid that is created. Um, isosceles right triangles, they have a leg, one of their legs is on the base. So these two legs right here have the same uh, length. And then this is your hypotenuse. Uh, you can see what that solid looks like from the different angles. Okay, but this is essentially what we're creating. What y'all did was just a practical size model because we didn't have time to make this many uh, figures there to put together. But the digital allows us to... Um, see this. Now, I've never seen them actually ask about pentagons, but here's what regular pentagons would look like for a solid. Um, that one's a little crazy looking. It's got some different shape to it um, than the other ones did. Uh, most of the time, what they're going to ask you to do are squares, semicircles, and sometimes they ask about the triangles as well. So here's another model um, let's look at it really quick because we're actually going to look at doing this between two curves as well. Um, there we go. Okay, so here this one has two curves, the red curve and the blue curve. Um, looks like maybe the square root and x squared um, intersecting. So here's the xy axis visual of it and then over here is the 3D visual of what's happening. So if we've got squares, as we increase the number of squares that we draw in there, obviously we end up with our complete solid. Um, so you can see what that looks like there with the squares. And then let's see your equilateral triangles. We saw that on the other one. Um, but this one looks just a little bit different because of the curve. It kind of actually has a a swivel in that ridge on the top there. So that's kind of cool. And then semicircles. Again, that's usually always going to be your smallest uh, solid created uh, just because of the way that those semicircles uh, are made up. Um, so we can see that we would have the largest radius in this region right here. So that would be the tallest part of our three dimensional solid that is created. All right, so let's look at the actual calculus behind this. And print it off the notes so you don't have to write all this down. Okay. 
So, again, relate this to when we did the right and left-handed um, rectangles. When we were approximating area, we found out that, okay, so if we continue to make those rectangles smaller and smaller and smaller, we're going to get a more accurate depiction of the actual area of the curve. So essentially, if we can make the rectangles so that they're just lines and add up all those lines, then we're going to get the area of the curve, and that came from the integral. Same thing here. Um, if we can take those prisms and make them smaller and smaller and smaller, so that essentially they're just a whole bunch of squares lined up against each other, think about a, a stack of CDs. Okay, think about a stack of CDs. If you add up all the volumes of those CDs, or essentially if you just have the area of the circle and you add up all the areas of those circles, you're going to get the volume of that entire solid there. So that's what we're going to do. We are going to integrate from whatever the starting point is to the ending point, the areas of the cross sections. So these formulas are in very general terms because it depends on what cross section you're talking about. Are you talking about a square? Its area formula is side squared. Uh, are you talking about a circle or a semicircle? That's one half pi r squared. So the a of x or the a of y is going to be different depending on what your cross sections are. Um, there I just have another illustration of uh, a curve the first one has cross sections that are perpendicular to the x axis and then the second one has cross sections that are perpendicular to the y axis so it does form a slightly different uh, solid they're they're very similar but they're not exactly the same um, and then that two-dimensional figure here that i have is just an illustration of the cross section the base of the cross section is going to be uh, these lines, it, if they're perpendicular to the x-axis, the base of the cross-section are, are going to be these lines. I just have some in random places. So you can see they differ depending on your location, and they are dictated by whatever the curve is. So we're going to use in some way the equation of the curve um, to, to be calculating these things. So since we just did um, a physical model using the square root of x, let's actually um, do this. Let, let's calculate the actual volume. We're going to do squares and semicircles. So we'll see how close your estimations there were with the squares and the semicircles. So in general, your steps for doing these problems is I would always, always, always graph the base of the solid. Now, Sometimes these are calculator active questions. Sometimes they're calculator inactive questions. It really just depends on the function that they give you. Uh, so sometimes you'll have your calculator to help you, sometimes you won't. So you need to have a pretty good idea of what these functions uh, look like in general. So I've already got the graph there for you. I have the square root of x. I have x equals 9 and y equals 0 to show you exactly which part we're talking about. We need to figure out the area formula for our cross-sections. Then we need to set up our integral and then evaluate that integral. Um, so here we're talking about area of a square. So area is going to be your side length squared, whatever your side length is squared. So let's figure out what exactly is our side length. So if you're if, if you need that visual, and most people do, I would go on my a graph of the base of my solid, and I would just put some random <clears throat> segments in there to illustrate where some cross sections would be so that I can get a visual of, okay, so that is the side of my square. How can I, what, what is dictating the length of the side of that square? Well, it's the function, right? If I needed to find this length here at two, then the length of that segment would be the y value. Would it not? The y value would give me the length of that section, so the y value is my function, the square root of x. So I'm going to plug the square root of x in for s, because it is the side length. 
and it is being squared. So squaring the square root, it cancels. So that is my area formula for these squares. It's just x. The area formula for these squares is just x. So let's set up our integral. So our volume is equal to the integral from where did we start? Zero to where we end? Nine. Of my area formula, my area formula for this one is just x. And we're doing this with respect to the x-axis, so it's dx. And then it's just a matter of integrating. Add one to my exponent, divide by my new exponent. I'm evaluating from 0 to 9. So I've got 9 squared over 2 minus 0 squared over 2. So 81 over 2, which I don't know if we need the actual value. And I should know this is 40.5. I don't know why I got my, got my calculator. 40.5, we are talking about volume. We don't have specific units here, so we're just going to say units cubed. We don't have specific units, so we'll just go with units cubed. Okay, now, I don't think we can necessarily compare this with anyone's estimation because I told you to actually physically measure it. So you have inches versus these are just units on uh, the graph, I mean, we could do a little conversion. You could see how um, physically how much one unit measures and go from there, but we'll just leave it um, with the units cubed here, okay? So that is the actual volume of the solid, the 3D solid that would be created if um, we had cross sections that were squares perpendicular to the x-axis, okay? What if they're semicircles? What if they're semicircles as opposed to squares? Um, so same curve, but we have a different area formula. Area of a semicircle is one half pi r squared. It's half of the area of a circle. We've got to figure out what the radius is going to be. So this segment right here at two, is that the radius? No, that's the diameter. So the diameter here is equal to the square root of x, but we need the radius. So the radius would be half of the square root of x. So plug that into your area formula. So you get 1 half times pi times square the square root and square the 2. When you square a fraction, you got to square the numerator and the denominator. And then that would give us pi over 8 times x. I'm writing it that way because I'm going to have to turn around and integrate it. So that just um, helps me with the integration because I have a constant multiple times my variable. So let's set up the volume integral this time. Zero is still 0 to 9. We're still starting at 0. We're still ending at 9. Uh, but this time our area is pi over 8 times x. I'm going to stick the pi over 8 in front because it's just a constant multiple. Don't let it distract you. So really our integration is the same as it was before. We just have a pi over eight in front of the whole thing. So really we can use our result from what we just did, right? We know that the, anti or the evaluating x squared over two from zero to nine is 81 over two. So that would be 81 pi over 16. I don't think that that fraction reduces. So that would be an exact answer there. Let's get an approximation so we can compare it to the 40.5. 81 pi over 16. Whoops. That is approximately 15.9. 0, 4 cubic units. Now, you've got a physical illustration in front of you. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that that solid using the semicircles is smaller than the solid using the squares. Um, it's almost a third smaller um, because, again, 
the height of the the height of that solid is dictated by the radius. The radius is only half of the width of the curve. Uh, so that's where that difference is coming into play. All right, I think we got time for one more here. Find the volume of the solid with a base that is bounded by, we're going to look at one with two curves here. 1 minus x over 2 and negative 1 plus x over 2 and x equals 0. The cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are rectangles with heights that are twice the base. So I've drawn the curves in there for you. You can see those. Um, the purple one is uh, 1 minus x over 2. Uh, the darker one is negative 1 plus x over 2. The x equals 0 is just telling you to start on the y-axis there. And then we can see here that they intersect at 2. If we weren't given the picture, then we would need to set the equations equal to each other to see where they intersect. All right, so we, we really already know that the beginning of our volume formula is going to be the integral from 0 to 2. We know that much already. We know our limits. We know where we're starting. We know where we're ending. we got to figure out our area formula. So area of a rectangle is length times width or width times height, what, however you want to look at it. It doesn't matter. It's one dimension times the other dimension. <clears throat> so let's, let's draw a couple of examples of uh, the bases here. They are perpendicular to the x-axis. So we are looking at these pieces right here. These are just a couple of examples of the bases of our rectangles here. Maybe I should use base times height instead of length times width since we're going 3D here. I'm going to use base times height. really doesn't matter. I just think it, it helps with the three-dimensional part of this. All right, so the base here... This length would be, we've got this y value here, and we've got this y value here. Together, they would make up that entire base. So let's see if we can figure out a algebraic way of expressing that. We've got the top curve minus the bottom curve. We've got the top curve minus the bottom curve. Now, the reason why I subtract the bottom curve is because the bottom curve would have a negative y value. Remember, the 1, over, one minus x over 2 is representing the y value there. The negative 1 plus x over 2 is representing the other y value. So it's negative. So if I subtract the negative, it's like I'm adding the positive. So I'm really I'm adding these two y values together here to get the actual length of that base there. If you don't trust me, uh, pick out part of it. Let, let's go right at the beginning. Okay, at zero, you can physically see that the length of that segment should be positive two. Well, how do we get positive two from one and negative one? One minus negative one equals positive two. So it's the top y value minus the bottom y value is going to be your base times the height is twice the base. So how about we simplify this expression first before we come up with what twice that is. So distribute the negative. So we've got 1 plus 1 is 2. We have negative x over 2 plus negative x over 2. So isn't that just negative x? All right, negative 2x over 2 would just be negative x. So this is the expression for the base. 2 minus x would be the expression for the base. Check it. If our x value is 0, 2 minus 0 would be the length of that segment. Look at the end. The end, that if there is no segment, so 2 minus 2 is 0. So it appears to work. The height is twice the base. So 2 times that expression right there is our height. 4 minus 2x is the height. Now, I know I'm going to have to integrate this, so I might as well multiply out this expression, right? 2 times 4 is 8. My outside gives me negative 4x. My inside gives me negative 4x. And my last gives me positive 2x squared. 
So we're gonna integrate this expression right here. That is our area. That will calculate the area for each of those rectangles. So we plug it in and we're gonna integrate. So 8x minus 4x squared plus 2 thirds x cubed. And we're gonna evaluate from zero to two. Plug in the two. When we plug in zero, we don't get anything. And the 16 minus 16 cancels. So this area, or this volume, excuse me, is 16 over 3 cubic units.